great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Christophe Michel, who is the CIBM Hugun EG Huguenish uh, section head. And he will be giving a short introduction to our speaker today, who is uh, Thomas Ross, also in the same section and also with Synapse. And uh, I'll leave it to uh, Christophe. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Good morning, everybody. I hope you hear me. I'm in a particular situation here in the car because of traffic problems. But I hope, do you hear me more or less? Yes. You do? Yes, okay, so. perfectly. Yeah, please talk to me. He is a <laughs> member of the Asuje Unise Nietzsche section of the CBM. So, Thomas uh, did his Bachelor in Physics from the uh, Imperial College in London some time ago, then did a Master's in Neuroscience from uh, Louis Pasteur University in Strasbourg. And then his PhD in psychology from the Goldsmiths University in London, where he was with Professor uh, who is one of the pioneers in uh, EG neurofeedback. And since then, he's working actually very uh, intensively on EG neurofeedback, what he's going to talk about today. He then hit his, his postdoc at the University of Western Ontario in, in Canada, where he was studying the influence of neurofeedback of fMRI network uh, in PTSD uh, patients. Since 2012, he's at the University of Geneva, first with Patrick Wimier. working on neurofeedback to regulate uh, hemineglect with Patrick and empathy with uh, David. He was then uh, working with Dimitri van der Wille on a Lennart's Foundation study on neurofeedback and since 2018 at the Department of Psychiatry uh, with Nader Perro on neurofeedback for ADHD. Since 2019, as I said, he had he joined the stadium here in Geneva uh, and working uh, for us uh, to 60% and still 40% with the psychiatry department. Uh, he is working on a very particular type of EEG analysis, which concerns the EEG microstates, one of the main topics of my lab since, since many, many years. Uh, EEG microstates are, let's say, temporarily uh, Evolved because uh, EEG can record them in a millisecond range and you will see from Thomas in his probably introduction that we can show a very fast dynamics of uh, resting state networks with these EEG microstates. The uh, school of Dietrich Lehmann has, uh, and including myself, have since very long time, actually since 1980, we are uh, describing functional networks with EEG, the called since then, these microstates. While these EG microstates were initially largely ignored in the literature and mainly described by scholars of Dietrich Lehmann, the field literally exploded at around 2010 when the fMRI resting states were uh, introduced. And from around five papers, I just looked it up, from around five papers in 100 citations in uh, EG microstates in 2000. Here and 2,000 citations uh, of EG microstates. The applications of EG microstates are seen in very different fields, particularly in clinical neuroscience, with the aim to determine biomarkers of different diseases. And Thomas will probably talk about that. But what Thomas Ross is now going uh, is now doing is going one step further and uses EG microstate as a feature for EEG. <laughs> has been described only once in the literature up to now, but I think has a very big promise uh, in, in, in the future. So I hope you're interested in what he's going to talk about. And I hope he will convince you that EG can look at EG uh, at resting state networks in a different way, namely in a temporally resolved way. So I, I, I let Thomas give your presentation, please. Uh, Thank you, thank you, Christoph. Despite the technical difficulties, That's thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I will start a, a little introduction about um, microstates for the uninitiated. Um, basically, what are EG microstates? And uh, if 
if you're familiar with the EEG signal, you can see here, uh, there's a plot of the multi-channel signal. And that means there are electrodes here on the, on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Uh, you can see there's multiple electrodes. And um, if we take just one particular moment in time, time sample, uh, you can see there's a clear um, field associated with that time sample across electrodes. And that's the electric field um, generated by neuronal activities and mainly in the cortex. Uh, then if you take another sample, you might find that the field is, becomes different uh, depending on how these uh, neuronal generators are oriented and active, and then another one and another one, for example. So these are like four examples where the fields look different. And what you can also try to do then is see if there's any kind of relationship between these patterns uh, across time and whether maybe there are some recurrent patterns occurring in the EEG. Uh, so this is like spontaneous EEG resistant EEG. Um, and mathematically, you can try to express that as a kind of a clustering of different topographies. So if you take a topography for each time sample, and you know you have 100 samples per second, like 100 hertz uh, resolution, you have quite a lot of these topographies. But you can use k-means as an algorithm to cluster, try to cluster these, um, these, these patterns. Um, and if you think about why do these patterns look like that, um, that's because uh, basically, it's like a forward model of what the point source of uh, electrical activity that projects to the to the scalp, and it creates these kind of um, sort of circular patterns. That if you imagine one one metaphor is if if you imagine somebody sleeping in a tent at night and uh, they switch on the flashlight and uh, they point the flashlight towards the top of the tent from the outside. When you're looking, you'll see sort of patterns of the of the light being projected onto the outside of the tent. And um, that's a little bit the same with electric fields, which are electromagnetic fields, just like light. Um, essentially, you see these kind of patterns of generators that are co-active at the same time. So there are groups of, of EEG generators um, that create these sort of uh, low, complex, low complexity patterns. Now, if you were to then cluster these patterns, we find that actually they fall into groups, uh, so-called microstates or states. Um, here you can see, for example, state one, um, is re re relevant to this pattern here. So this pattern occurs at the beginning, for example, here, and then it switches to the, the, the light blue pattern. And then uh, if you think that in terms of similarity, so you basically use a spatial correlation coefficient to look at how similar these patterns are. And uh, you can see that some of them occur for longer periods of time. Sometimes they're also short and they're distributed in the, actually in a scale-free fashion. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of... Um, signature of a critical system, um, a poison in equilibrium. And essentially, sometimes you have very long patterns that occur for even a, uh, a few hundred milliseconds. Sometimes on average, they're about 100 milliseconds each. Okay. And then, of course, um, we found that these patterns are replicable across subjects. And uh, they've also been given names like microstate 1, microstate 2, in the sequence of kind of how, they, uh, how much they represent the EG. Uh, or in, uh, in, in symbolic uh, terms like A, B, and C, and D. Um, now, of course, the EEG is much more complex than just four patterns, for example. Um, and it's, it's just a model, right? So um, models are useful. Uh, they're not that accurate, but they are useful to sort of get a more lower complexity picture of, of what we're trying to uh, look at. So they simplify um, the understanding of the data and uh, as you'll see, hopefully they also provide some useful insights that we can capture and also maybe have a, a, um, a more parsimonious uh, model of what, what is going on. So basically leading to a better understanding of, or simpler understanding of what's going on in the Egypt. And why, why uh, microstates are interesting? I think they're interesting from the point of view of the dynamical systems models that are now kind of in the vogue, um, which you know describe kind of uh, changes in brain activity shifting from different types of states uh, is a little bit like if you think about like um, an attractor landscape. So they're kind of different energy states. The, the brain is metastable. It means that it's moving from one state to another that you know, um, supports computational um, processing. And if you think that these kind of basins of attraction are a little bit like these uh, microstates. So you have a particular configuration of the EG, uh, EG activity pattern that, that goes into that configuration then that pattern remains stable for a while, depending on the depth of this basin. If the depth of the basin is, uh, is high, large, then you know, the state will um, recur for uh, longer. 
So it will, it will become uh, more, more prevalent in time. The state duration will be uh, higher. And then if it's then after it emerges from that uh, attractor, it will go into a new configuration. It's called a basin B. Here, the, the attractor is shallower, so the state will be shorter. Okay. And then, of course, you can calculate also these probabilities of each of these states occurring across time. And then you can say, okay, some states are more stable than others. Some states uh, occur with higher probability than others and so on. So this is interesting from the point of view of trying to define behavioral states or um, also states in clinical disorders. And so, as I, as I mentioned, um, we, can, we can basically visualize, um, sort of summarize these kind of state transitions in, in terms of symbolic dynamics. And so if we name these states A, B, and C, and D, depending if how many we have, then we kind of have a kind of a, a syntax of these states across time. So this is the so-called microstate sequence. And it's a little bit like the language of the brain. So if you imagine that um, each, uh, each state uh, is like a letter, then you know, you're spelling out words. So the main features that we look at when we're calculating microstates is uh, three features. One is the duration. So that's basically how many samples it takes until the, the state occurs and then um, lasts. Then after that, that's in milliseconds. So it's usually a mean duration over multiple states for a particular uh, microstate map. And then after that, it's, it's the, the amount of times that state reoccurs. So of course, these two are related but they're not exactly the same mathematically. And then of course, finally, um, the time coverage, which is the total amount of samples uh, of, in that particular state over the total possibility of, um, of samples. So it's sort of expressed a little bit like a percentage. So the time coverage essentially um, represents a little bit the prevalence of that state. So, so we have those three measures that we usually look at. So I gave an introduction to EG microstate. I just wanna give a little, introduction to also machine learning since we've been using machine learning now for, for classifying these microstates. Sorry, can I ask yeah. you a question? Yes, just, sure. just, uh, so you, you mentioned like these states, right? Now they are from A to D, but yes. you, you set up this number. Yes, like exactly. So, so how, how is this, this number of clusters generated? Yeah, good question. Um, essentially, there is, um, so far we, we've been using a low number of states just to kind of simplify models, but, um, but of course, there could be as many states as you want, technically. Um, what we found, uh, in a, and also in the literature, is that uh, somewhere between four to six states, or seven states, explains quite a lot of the EG variance. So up to 70 to 80 percent of the variance. All states, I think, is something like 70 percent, and then it goes up to to higher uh, with more states. So you you capture the, the the a large part of the EG with with that kind of um, compression. But so, um, but of course people can also look at uh, more states, and that's something that needs to be investigated further. Um, the question is also the replicability of that, of those kind of uh, markers over, over subjects and over states. So we find that four to five states seems to be the most rapid across subjects. Uh, so getting to the machine learning uh, aspect, just a small introduction. I mean, what is actually machine learning? And one example is, for example, how to predict a person, if, if a person is male or female based on uh, two variables, height or weight, for example. Um, well, here you have a distribution of uh, female and male height and weight um, across the range of values. And you can see there's a clear clusters here for, for female and male. Um, but were you to try to separate those two uh, clusters with only one variable, well, this is the height variable. You can see it's not a clean separation. And if you try to do the same with weight, the separation is not uh, optimal either, right? So essentially machine learning is a curve fitting exercise to see how you can separate two classes or multiple classes uh, between each other. Um, and so in this case, this would be the best separation matrix. Uh, separation. So um, that's basically machine learning in a nutshell. It's, it's trying to find the right um, fit of a curve to separate um, data in, in multiple dimensions. Uh, now here it's the case of two dimensions. This is a linear fit, so it's a linear model, but of course you can also have nonlinear fits and that makes it model even more complex. Um, so in, in the context of microstates, you can see here, for example, if we had two variables like the time coverage of microstate three and time, time coverage of microstate five, you see they reside in two clusters. And again, 
if you were to try to separate those two, two distributions using only one of those um, variables, it would not be optimal. So in this case, this is the best, uh, the best uh, separation, which is based on both variables, right? The kind of the ratio of both variables. Uh, another uh, key aspect of, of um, machine learning is, is basically fitting the curve, and, and in this context, is uh, the issue of cross-validation. So what happens in machine learning is if, if you use the same training data as testing data, which means that you test the model on the same data as you train it, then you have things such, such a thing called overfitting, where basically you're, you're fitting noise to the data and to the specifics of the data, but it doesn't generalize very well out of sample. Uh, now, one way to minimize overfitting is to basically use cross-validation, which, uh, which uh, basically splits the data into bits of data that are seen and unseen for the model. So in this case, for example, if you use five-fold cross-validation, you split the data into um, five parts, four, four of which are the training data, so 80%, and the last part, the fifth part, is the so-called test data. And then you essentially train the model on, uh, on this training data of 80% of the samples. And then you test the model, test the prediction of the accuracy uh, on 20% of the data. And then you do the same thing for other parts of the data. So you hold out, again, the second part of the data, the third part, fourth part, which is the folds, and the fifth part. And in that case, you, you actually create a model which is a little bit more robust to noise and um, overfit. So in the case of uh, application of uh, machine learning to microstates, here's one example um, of, of a clinical study where they looked at uh, EG microstates in um, schizophrenia, schizophrenia patients. And uh, this is actually a study here at the EPFL uh, that was published in Nature Communication recently. Um, and they looked at basically these microstate measures um, across, uh, across siblings and patients and controls. And um, essentially, they had uh, 101 patients with schizophrenia, 43 uh, siblings with of schizophrenia patients that were unaffected, so they didn't have actually uh, symptoms of psychosis, and 75 uh, neurotypical controls. Now, the first thing, if you just look at group averages, what they found was that, so the EG, the EG data is basically based on five minutes of rest state EG, 64 channel recording, and they used a broadband signal of one to four hertz. And what they found is, if you looked at the, the group differences, mainly the class D seems to be uh, the highest effect size, which you can see here in patients, uh, it's much lower um, in time coverage than in uh, controls. And uh, the mean duration is also shorter, so it seems like this attractor is shallower. The state of, of, of MAP D is not, is not visited uh, frequently enough, and uh, also it's, it's very short. Um, and also the occurrence you can see here is also uh, less represented. So overall, that class seems to be uh, under prevalent. Now class C is also over prevalent, um, as you can see. So it's kind of a balance between those two classes. One is underrepresented, one is overrepresented. Um, and so what, um, what I also did, just in, in the interest of uh, open science and replicability, uh, this is actually used their data to see if I can classify it based on, on these uh, on the study. So this is the source data that they, uh, they published uh, in a sort of a tabular, uh, tabular format. And I just took these individual values for each patient and I tried to see with this study how much uh, classification accuracy we can get using um, this data because it's a large sample of 101 patients. Um, and essentially, so if we just look at each of these features on their own, uh, we use a linear support vector machine uh, algorithm to classify the data using tenfold cross-validation. So we hold out 10% um, of the data at a time. Uh, these, we're going to do uh, just a, a two-way classification uh, between schizophrenia patients and controls. And uh, the total number of features is 12, which is essentially based on the four maps plus the three microstate temporal measures, time coverage, duration, and occurrence. Okay. And if you just look at each feature on their own, this, this is the classification accuracy uh, you achieve uh, with each feature. So uh, you see here uh, microstates A, B, C, and D. And what, what is highlighted is kind of the maximum classification you get per feature is something around uh, above 70% uh, 
um, either you use uh, microstate B occurrence to get 70% accuracy or microstate C coverage for 71% uh, accuracy. So that's if you use only each feature at a time, which is not bad considering, um, you know, psychiatric disorders are very difficult to classify um, generally. So 70% is already quite high based on the literature. Uh, some people use fMRI uh, data to classify psychiatric disorders, and this is on the same uh, kind of level of uh, accuracy. Um, but if you were to use multiple features, so if you combine these features, and in this case, uh, we use this uh, one algorithm called ReliefF, which looks at what are the most significant features and then tries to select the top features that give the best classification accuracy okay. um, by looking at how they're correlated and how independent they are. So basically, if any extra features give extra information, then they will be put into the model. And here you can see a summary of that, uh, that analysis where, where we looked at the balanced accuracy, which is kind of the average of the sensitivity and the specificity of the model. Um, and you can see here the relief F uh, model uh, provides, uh, this, this is the 71% I showed you at the beginning when you use only one feature, that's the maximum. But once you start to combine multiple features, you, you do get a boost of around 5%, um, but that's maintained after um, you, you introduce two features. And the, the null model is essentially, if you were to shuffle the labels randomly, what would you get with this kind of, uh, um, this kind of uh, data? So you can see it's around 50%. There's a little bit of overfitting there, but it's, it's between 50 and 55%. So th this model, you know, the, the cross-validation actually is quite good to, um, to compensate for that. Um, so I think that the data shows that uh, these microstates are actually robust markers of, of some, some neurophysiological um, differences between patients and controls. So yep. Patient and controls or patient and siblings? Yeah, patients and controls. Patient and controls. Yeah. Um, and here you can see these two features that were selected by, by the relief F, the top two features that they lead to 75% accuracy. So here's the coverage of microstate C uh, at the bottom, and then the coverage of microstate D at the top uh, in the y-axis. So you can see that you know using only one or two, one of the, just one or two of those. Um, um, dimensions would not give you clean separation. So, so essentially the, the separation is around here. So we use both of those dimensions to classify uh, schizophrenia 75%. Okay. And so if you wanted to really compare statistically whether these two models are different between the one feature only model and the two feature only, two feature only model, then you can uh, create such a thing as, a, as an AUC area, um, so a rock curve the receiver operating characteristic curve that looks at the classification across the whole range of thresholds. Um, so it moves uh, this line, this green line uh, across um, the, the, the sort of, you can get more, you know, higher classification of patients or lower classification of controls depending on, on the threshold of where the line is. And um, across all those um, values of pos uh, false positives and, and, and false negatives, you basically have um, a statistical difference between the models. So the sort of second model, again, is, is more uh, statistically significant than the first one. So it shows formally that basically using two features is better than using only one feature. Maybe I missed it, but um, uh, what do you mean with the two features? Like are you taking more uh, time, time step or? Uh, no, I, you just use uh, the two microstates maps. Ah, two yeah. together. Yeah, so one. you see here, the, this one here. The coverage of map C and the coverage of map D. So they're, they're, they have different values. So if you use each one independently, then if you just use this one here, then you would have to make a cut here, right? And if you just use the, the D independently, you have to make a cut there. But if you use both, then you can basically leverage the ratio between the two. The same frequency range. Yes, yes. It's the same data, it's just um, there are different measures of microstates. Mm -hmm. The coverage is basically the kind of the percent time active in a particular microstate. So, for example, this patient here, um, this, oops, this patient here has 50% uh, time coverage, and but only 10%, 15% uh, uh, coverage of, of microstate C. Okay. Thomas. Yes. If you would, if you do, if you would do the ratio between the two. As, yeah. as, as one feature, you will get the same thing? Most, most probably, yes. Most okay. probably, yeah. 
the whole point of the relief, uh, the feature selection is that it looks at the data and, cal and calculates what's the best combination. So it's kind of looking for that. So it, it looks at the ratios of the, the informational independence between the features and it, you know, hunts down the best combination. So, I mean, you can do it manually by calculating the ratio between all the features, but the, yeah. the feature selection method is, is faster. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, using the ratio directly uh, would work, exactly. So we'll talk about that in, in terms of also maybe classifying uh, in, in real time. So um, actually, and after this, um, once, once I started doing machine learning with much states, uh, we also asked ourselves in the lab, Christophe, um, Michelle, and also um, my, my PhD student, uh, Victor Ferrat, whether we could maybe um, improve a little bit this, this uh, these, um, this approach with microstates and um, classifying brain states and extended the model a bit to make it a little bit more complex, but not too complex. So we had this idea that was actually proposed a very long time, first time when microstates were introduced, uh, where you could look at microstates, but in particular frequency bands. So instead of looking at microstates at just the broadband frequencies, so just calculate the topographies in each time point, um, but you filter the data from one to 40 Hertz, so what would happen if you calculate these microstate measures in narrow bands, like uh, alpha, delta, theta, and so on, these classical sort of EEG bands that we know where neural uh, oscillations uh, operate. Okay? So that's what I uh, call the spectral decomposition of EEG microstates. And we just recently published a paper on this. Uh, on this. But um, the rationale for using this, as I mentioned, is because there seems to be evidence that, you know, um, EEG oscillations and EEG um, sort of activity isn't in one particular frequency. In fact, it varies across different areas of the brain. And you can see here, for example, the alpha peak frequency decreases uh, over um, when you go from posterior to anterior. Okay? So um, that's one thing. So there might be some frequency shifts that might not be accounted for um, by, by just using a broadband model. And then, of course, this is the case for theta as well. So you see, as the alpha peak frequency decreases, going from um, anterior to uh, posterior to anterior, the opposite happens with theta. The, the theta frequency uh, increases in frequency as you're going more anterior. So it seems like there might be some kind of preferred generators of these frequencies in different anatomical regions of the brain, right? And so since we're with microstates, we're looking at these kind of spatial. Uh, let's say anatomically spatial patterns, then they might be also sensitive to differences in frequencies. And in fact, here there's this um, study where they looked at um, <coughs> frequencies in particular areas of the brain, which is a similar study that looked at the peak frequency, for example. So for example, in the, in the posterior parts of the brain, in the occipital lobe, um, it's very well known that actually uh, most of the generators of the ejectivity are in this sort of alpha band range. So that's the blue band here, which is uh, has a peak around 10 hertz, right? That's kind of the, the resonant frequency of the visual cortex. Um, for example, then the motor cortex has it uh, also around um, um, around 10 hertz, but sometimes also in, uh, in, in the supplementary motor area, you have these frequencies around beta range, which are around 20 hertz, a little bit like different radio stations that operate at different frequencies, okay? Um, and then find, finally here, for example, in the hippocampus, there's a famous theta rhythm that sort of operates around five, about four to seven hertz here. That has a, a peak there. So that's another network, let's say. And then you have also the anterior cingulate that again has uh, its own kind of uh, frequency preference. For example, here you can see this again in theta or in delta. So again, others, other studies that showing that um, different areas of the cortex have preferred frequencies, okay? So actually you can just look at some raw EG data and see if this is, might be the case. Um, and here, whatever, I just took a random subject, <coughs> the healthy subject, uh, um, and I filtered the data at uh, four to eight Hertz, which is the theta band. Um, and if I just take a, a random time point here, um, for example, random slice, I can look at the topography and at this, uh, this exact time point of one second and 728 milliseconds, you have this topography here, which looks a little bit like this microstate D map, okay? So it has a frontal um, maximum. And then if I filter the same data, the same subject, the same data, but I, I filter it in alpha band, okay? Um, and I just take the same time point, 
um, then I do not have this topography anymore. In fact, there's some more lateral topography that's, that's active. So it appears like if you if you if you filter the bands into different uh, frequencies, you might not get the same topographies, uh, or especially you might not get the same uh, sequence of topographies in in time. Okay, so it seems like. The, the, the spatial temporal dynamics appear different between the different spectral brands. So the question is, does, do these different spectral brands hold any, any kind of useful information or different information from each other? So that's what the research questions we uh, asked ourselves with uh, my PhD student, Victor Ferra. Um, the first question was, are these classical microstates that we see in the broadband EG, uh, could they be a mixture of different spectral components? Specific components. Um, how similar might the microstate topographies be across frequencies? So, are these uh, microstate maps similar across frequencies or not? And maybe does this spectral, uh, extra spectral information that we might get from separately decomposing different frequencies um, provide any independent uh, in information, right? That we could then also maybe harness for machine learning. And actually, here we took an open data set. Um, from uh, from this study here, um, it's called the Lemon dataset from Leipzig, uh, and it's a very nice dataset. It has 61 scalp electrodes, 203 healthy subjects under uh, both eyes open and eyes closed conditions, um, and essentially we applied this spectral decomposition method uh, to the data. So essentially, it's very straightforward. You take you have two steps. One is you narrow band, narrow band the filter the data. You can use a normal uh, filter like a finite impulse response filter or a wavelet filter, doesn't really matter. But as long as you separate into kind of different non overlapping frequency bands. And then step two is you just apply the same much state algorithm sort of pipeline to that data. And then you look at, okay, what do the much state maps look like and what are the temporal measures associated with it? And so the first part is where we looked at the k means clustering. What do the maps look like? And in fact, interestingly, we find the same maps uh, across all the bands. So the sort of these, let's say, neuronal generators are conserved across different frequency bands. So it's not like neural generators only operate in one frequency band preferentially, but maybe they have a preference, but they're still active in other frequencies. So that's why you find them, all these maps are present in both in delta, theta, alpha, and beta, right? And where the broadband is probably a composite of all those. All those uh, activities. And then the same thing was uh, under eyes closed. So again, the maps are conserved under different behavioral conditions. That means the anatomical generators have not really changed orientation or change location. Um, they're conserved. So even as you change behavioral states, you know, those kind of um, activity, activities remain fixed, at least spatially, right? The question is, are there any temporal differences? And so to do that, we, we assess the mutual information between the microstate temporal sequences. Uh, mutual information is a little bit like a correlation between, uh, between data, but since the data is not numerical, you can't really apply a correlation coefficient between symbolic data. But if you consider that symbolic data is like categories or symbols, you can actually look at the overlap. Okay, are the symbols the same or not? And if they're the same, then they have high mutual information. If the symbols are different, then they have no mutual information. And we looked at sort of mutual information within broadband filter data and the different sequences in the narrow band data. Okay. So you just take one per subject, every, uh, um, the, the sequences from broadband data and then the sequences from all the different narrow bands. And you see, okay, how much of their overlap, how much of the mutual information is there between those sequences? And that's expressed as a percentage. So it goes from zero to one, one being the highest uh, sort of mutual information is basically the same sequence, zero so being completely different sequence. And we found that actually the mutual information between broadband and all of these narrow bands is actually quite low, so below 10% in most cases. Um, you can see here, this one clearly stands out um, under eyes closed, the alpha here. And that's actually um, expected because alpha goes up under eyes closed and it dominates the, the basic topographies of EG. So, there, there's a much higher percentage um, explained, shared between broadband and alpha, um, but it will depend on brain state as well. So if you have lower power of a particular rhythm, you might have very low um, similarity between broadband and these other frequency bands. 
And if you look at them um, between the frequency bands themselves, so here the broadband is, is this column here, which is essentially the, the figure I just showed you, A, but you can also look at between alpha and delta, for example, here, or um, delta and theta, or alpha and beta, and here the actual values are very small. So it looks like temporally, at least instantaneously, these topographies are different, and these informational um, kind of dynamics are different. So the hypothesis would be then, if they are informationally different, that they would provide that <coughs> some separate information that would increase classification errors, right? Um, so just a, a schematic about how these bands might be related to the different microstate maps. So actually, we, we, we calculated, uh, for example, the, the different uh, microstate measures. So here's an example of time coverage uh, across these different frequency bands. And you can see some clear uh, sort of separation between these patterns. So if you look at, for example, the patterns, the blue and the orange pattern here, you see they're more rectangular here. So they have more preference or prevalence in low beta and high gamma, right? And lower lower preference for the alpha and delta theta band in the delta and alpha and theta bands. And then you have the C uh, map here, which has the opposite. It's more like skewed toward the alpha and delta theta, so it's more more prevalent in those bands uh, relatively, right? And less prevalent in the beta and the gamma bands. And then D finally um, has its own thing, but it's also mostly prevalent in delta theta. Okay, so they have sort of different signatures. And this is just a summary that these maps, for example, A and B are more prevalent in beta and gamma, and C and D are more prevalent in alpha and in delta theta uh, spectrum. Um, so what happens if we try to classify um, these, these behavioral states um, with, with this kind of spectral decomposition? So actually, um, using the same kind of algorithm I showed you before with schizophrenia data, here you can see the broadband, this would be kind of reference model okay you can see here we're at 70 percent with one feature and then we go up to 75 with three features right? and, but then it plateaus around 75 uh, using the broadband uh, model um, essentially the other uh, bands like beta and delta and theta are actually lower than that but you get increased specificity if you filter in the alpha band so you get 80 uh, percent accuracy uh, compared to broadband so that's probably useful to, to know because you can improve your accuracy by filtering and narrowing that, okay? At least for this uh, state transition. And if you do a, a formal uh, comparison between the two models, it's actually highly significant. Um, the alpha band one um, explains much more uh, prediction accuracy, basically, uh, than the broad one. Uh, people in zero five. So now that we've sort of validated this model and some uh, healthy uh, subject data, we asked ourselves also, can you maybe use the same method to uh, classify you know, brain states in clinical disorders? So um, this is so-called uh, trying to apply it in a psychiatric disorder. One example is this uh, sort of called post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Um, people uh, after trauma, um, their EG uh, might be uh, different from, from neurotypical controls. And, here, uh, this was a collaboration with um, Western um, University in Canada, um, psychiatric department there. They, they actually had 61 subjects, um, healthy subjects that were controlled for you know, psychiatric uh, symptoms or neurological symptoms. And then uh, PTSD group, also the same number. So it's a balanced data set. And again, you can see here from these five maps, here, these are classical maps we will find in the literature. So, this was an analysis based on three minutes of ISO and rest state each. And this is just a special correlation between maps. So you can see that we're comparing apples to apples when, when you look at these maps between groups. So the correlation between, um, for example, map E of this group and this group is here five. It's 0 0.96, so it's very high. So it's practically the same map. So you can then basically use the same map to compare the microstate uh, measures. So on the group level, if you just look at the microstate duration, um, then one thing that stands out is that uh, PTSD uh, patients have a lower duration, um, especially in microstate E. Okay. Uh, so exclusively this map, let's say, because if you look at the effect sizes here, A, is actually, A and B are higher in duration, 
um, not significantly though. Um, and then here C is a little bit lower, but not significantly. D is a little bit higher, but E is significantly lower um, in a broadband analysis. Okay. But if you were to segment the same data into different frequencies, um, so this is your broadband um, model here. This value here is the effect size, the cones D effect size. Uh, you can see the cones D effect size is the most, is the, is the highest sort of effect size for the map E as I showed you, it's minus 0.7. But if you decompose data into different frequencies, then you can actually increase the effect size to minus 0.91 using the alpha band. Okay. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is that some effects that are not significant, let's say, in the other maps become significant in the, in the narrow band data. So for example, delta, delta band in microstate A is now significant, but it was not significant before in the broadband. This is corrected values, so that's why the values are lower than 4.5, but they're not highlighted as corrected significant. So um, finally, let's try to classify the data um, using the microstate measures. And you can see here that the broadband uh, model actually does not very well. Oops. Um, here, that's the black line here. It's maximum classification accuracy around 65%. Um, whereas if you look at the alpha band, it's higher. And it's somewhere around 76% with one feature, which is pretty high. And, uh, and it's higher than the, the delta band is the second 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 place. Um, interestingly, the lower number of features you have, the higher number of features you have, the lower the classification accuracy of the model. So it may mean that you're basically um, introducing noise into the into the model. So maybe even one or two uh, of these measures is enough to uh, encapsulate kind of the main difference between these populations, uh, which is useful as I show later maybe for for feedback. So here is actually, uh, you can ask the re relief F algorithm to um, basically sort the importance of each of these features. And you can see here, for example, the, in microstate E, uh, these are the top two features. Microstate E, I mean, duration and coverage together are quite important for broadband. Again, it's microstate E, but it's, uh, it's a different combination of features. And you could do the same thing, but now you classify by map only. So you take all the features in one map, so across all bands. So for example, and then here you can see that this map E is explaining again 76% classification accuracy. So um, in this case, if you take the, the sorting of the features for much state E map, in fact, you have the top two are actually alpha and delta together, if you were to go to two features. The two feature model doesn't necessarily explain more, right? Um, so it looks like it's not just one frequency that explains everything, but it could be a combination. Um, and this is the full spectrum of all of the features space. Uh, if you look at all these measures, so these are individual features, and you can see clearly here um, at the bottom is that the mean duration of microstate E in alpha is the key feature that gives you this classification accuracy. So this way, this way we kind of honed in on the, on the, on the main feature. And so the question is, what do you do with all this information? Okay, it's interesting to diagnose patients maybe, and you know, three out of four patients with 75% accuracy is not a bad uh, start for clinical um, sort of support, particularly clinical disorders, but uh, one direction we started to look at is, can we use this for therapy? Okay, and um, in this case, it would be interesting to see if you could, uh, you know, estimate microstates in real time. I mean, they're, they're actually poised to be estimated in real time because they're about Different, different states or the dynamic measures, and the EEG allows you to estimate these measures uh, with millisecond accuracy. Um, and there is a method that you know can be um, harnessed if you actually calculate these uh, metrics in real time. It's called neurofeedback. So neurofeedback uh, is a is a kind of a closed loop method um, that's uh, currently emerging as as a one way to uh, train brain activity, so train brain states. Um, so what happens is there's, there's kind of three components in your feedback. Uh, the first is the sensing aspect. So if you think about it like a closed loop, it starts like this. And the first part is the sensing where we actually measure the activity uh, that we want. So in this case, there's an EEG activity um, under multi-channel EEG. 
then that uh, EEG activity, for example, will get uh, processed. Uh, maybe it will be filtered, for example, in the alpha band. And then these uh, microstate maps um, will be calculated in real time. So basically, the topography of each map uh, per sample. And then, uh, for example, you will try to classify, OK, is it map A, map D, or whatever? And then after that, we will try to see whether that value is above or below the patient's mean, for example. If we want to increase the activity, then we would give the feedback that you know, if it's above the mean, then something in this game will uh, change. For example, the spaceship will go forward uh, when the max state um, coverage or duration is higher than the mean. For example, PTSD, this max state E is uh, lower, right? So we would want to increase it. And then that, that uh, change in the brain state will be fed back visually to the patient. And the patient will, through trial and error, uh, see whether there's any relationship between their brain state or even somatic states, whether, for example, microstate E might be related to relaxation or not, and then how, do, how does that uh, change the, the game? So they're looking, literally looking at their own brain activity in a kind of mirror through a game, and then seeing the relationship, okay, if I do this, or I think about this, or I attend, or I don't attend, what happens to this variable? And then they try to find a strategy, a cognitive strategy to control the variable. And this takes some time, but in many cases, it can even take um, only one session to learn to find the mapping. Um, just a little bit more about how we calculate these microstates in real time. Um, you can see here, these are the positive templates that you would um, sort of try to look at, uh, whether the, the activity is related to those, and then the negative ones are just the inverse patterns, which essentially um, are the same states, just inverted because of the dipole. Um, here, for example, you, if you take um, these are sample by sample, your time, and this is the spatial correlation coefficient. So when you're near about one or above 0.9, then, then that map is kind of occurring. So you can see here, for example, the microstate A map, which is this, um, sorry, B map, which is this um, reddish kind of orange map, is, is the maximum one here. So this is where microstate B is the winner. Okay. Then afterwards, for example, this map here with the microstate C map, because that, that has the highest spatial correlation. So essentially, you're flipping from microstate B to microstate D and so on. And then you can calculate for example, the, the, the duration or the time coverage of these states over a sliding window. So if you take a window of like 100 milliseconds, then you can say, okay, in this window, this, is, this was the dominant state, much state C, for example, here. Um, and then feedback, okay, the number of hits that you, you use to, to create those states, right, to control the states. And so this is a study that I actually recently done um, in Japan to look at if people can control the states. Um, and one of the first studies actually was done by Diaz Hernandez here in the uh, University of Bern uh, in Thomas Koenig's group. They showed that uh, healthy subjects can control microstate D. And more, more recently, in 2022, uh, they tried to uh, feed back these microstates uh, in real time um, to healthy subjects. And they found that the, the delay actually determines well the level of control. So if you give, if there's a delay of only one, uh, very little delay between in the loop, so that you get instantaneous feedback of what is your brain state. Then um, you can see here they have the maximum number of hits. Um, and if the delay is increased to one second, 20 seconds, then this, uh, this control uh, level of control decreases over time. And uh, finally, if you look at the individual states, some are more easily controlled than others. For example, actually state C here has the best control uh, for a delay of zero, and then the delay goes down. And here it's a little bit more noisy. So, but potentially there is an application there that we could use once from now they'll be able to biomarkers to train these states in, um, in um, clinical populations or maybe even in, in healthy populations, but towards particular, maybe like enhancing particular brain functions, attention, memory, and so on. We don't know yet uh, whether that's going to be successful, but that's basically the key goal. Uh, for a lab in the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Nice overview over all the different studies. I don't Thank know you. whether there are questions additional to the questions that were asked during the presentation. Is there some more questions open? Uh, I was wondering, like, are you computing the microstates uh, across all the patients uh, and then uh, you try testing them uh, on new patients? Or uh, 
like are the test uh, patients uh, being included all the time in microstate? You mean for the neurofeedback or so for uh, for the k-means uh, to extract the microstates? Usually, you would use a full sample to extract the states, the maps. And then what you do is you you pack fit. The, so once you've established that the templates are similar between groups, then you go into the individual level to um, use the same model to reconstruct the data. Uh, so I mean, there's two approaches. One, you could use individual maps, but they're a little bit more noisy, and so you're not really comparing apples to apples, but um, what you need to find is that on average, each patient, um, each patient's individual decomposition should be as close as possible to the group mean, right? So usually we have, uh, we, we exclude patients that have a, a correlation of less than 0.9 um, you know, individual subjects. But on average, the, the mean uh, spatial similarity between the group maps and the individual maps is above, above 0.9. So you ensure that each person's microstates are similar to the, to the, to the group mean. And uh, do you have a study like on uh, how much patients are correlated to each of them? So for instance, now you have uh, four states, for instance, in this picture. Yeah. Are there some uh, patients that activate more in one or in the other? Um, you mean, uh -huh, you, you're talking about variability within the patient group. Yes. Yeah. Sir. So it's, it's for sure there is some variability because um, you know, if all patients were um, homogenous around one particular pattern, then you would have like 100% classification accuracy rate, completely separate. So there's clearly some patients that do not demonstrate uh, that signature. And that's something that is uh, very common in, in, in general in brain disorders. There is some heterogeneity. So, of course, here we're looking at averages. So for classifying also the average, we know that 25% of the variance is unaccounted for. So we need to be careful that maybe in the future we don't apply only one protocol to all patients and treat them all as the same. So there might be some freedom for personalization, personalizing um, the treatment. Um, one way to do that, for example, that is now the fashion, um, is to use normative models. So you define the mean of the normal population and then you, you, you basically compare in each individual patient to that mean to look at their specific signature deviation. So there might be like one patient might have microstate D, you know, to this to this level, but another one will have more of some other. So, and then you can maybe even, you know, tailor the neurofeedback protocol to that to that signature, where you don't want to promote more of D but promote less of the other. So, that seems still remains to be explored. Okay, thanks. Maybe another another type to answer the question is that. Uh, a lot of uh, groups try to correlate the microstates with uh, clinical uh, symptoms, trying to see whether patients can have more or less of a feature of microstates depending on the symptoms or the sub-symptoms they have within, within the spectrum. That seems to be also the case. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So instead of taking this kind of categorical approach of you have only this diagnosis or not, you take a more like a dimensional approach where you correlate with particular dimensions of symptoms. So that could be also promising. So I, I have a maybe follow-up question mm -hmm. on this line, right? Because you, you showed all, um, I mean, it was really nice to see everything, but it, it, it lacks a bit of an, an understanding of what it means in yes. states, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, from a computational perspective, it, it all uh, yeah. flows very yeah. well, yeah. but at some point, uh, I mean, rather than dividing patient and non-patient, you want to put some biological meaning yeah. sure. to sure. these microstates. So maybe you can, for, for example, like in your third study, when you showed it, uh, perhaps you can separate mm -hmm patient with schizophrenia with strong controls with the alpha band with the state d which looked to me a, more like a, a posterior so more like occipital yeah. and, and in the study like two you said in healthy subjects you have similar thing with eyes closed eye opens yes and i was wondering whether in this study they actually track the eye motion to see or or the blinking to see whether uh, patient with schizophrenia maybe just simply had more blinking or maybe they were deviating more usually you you yeah. you fix across right yeah. but maybe those patients they don't uh, yeah. really listen to or they they are less uh, prone to 
keep fixing the cross, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or maybe they're better, I don't know, but it might be something just related with this very simple measure, which is keeping your eyes fixed on the yeah. cross. Yeah, and so you do everything just to see that. So I was wondering whether, you know, there are more indications that these sort of states are linked with some, with some properties of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting point, yeah, relevant question. Um, so in this case, for example, with the PTSDs, you want to, sorry, I think you mentioned yes. disease no, 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 schizophrenia, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But PTSD. in here, this is the state E here. It has lower um, during in the, in the duration, right? And if we flip back to eyes, eyes closed, eyes open. Sorry, this is here. I don't have yes. I don't have the decomposition by by map. Um, but so here we had four 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 maps. But I'm trying to see if I can get anything from this data. So this one is, is yeah, this one is with five maps. But I think um, I have to look at the paper. Um, I'm not sure. So my, my question is more like, do you think that these microstates are more related to the small behavior yeah, changes yeah. that the subject has during this recording mm -hmm. or some internal so, really well mechanism that, yeah. that makes the brain different in a way from, from subjects to Yeah, to it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. And in the sense of, you know, we like to categorize things into brain states and traits, right? And traits are like more long-term kind of in, ingrained and then the states are like more like variable depending on how you feel that day or how much sleep you have but i think it, it's uh, it might be like a false dichotomy because the same processes that you know are, are very sensitive to states might also be the same processes that actually differentiate different psychiatric groups and we know that you know, the way they feel when they describe things they feel oh, i feel very aroused or less aroused so yes it could be explained by you know eye, eye closure, but I think it's easy to control for that if you look at the blinks, so that you know that people have their eyes open. Um, and you know, for example, in the schizophrenia sample, it wasn't the much state E, it was the much state D. And that one is less relevant to, to this eyes opening state. So it does appear there is specificity there, but um, you know, in support of what I'm trying to say is that actually you can see here with the eyes closed, eyes open. This is not a trait per se, but much states are sensitive to that. So the question is, you know, how does the behavior link to the clinical problem? And it should really be linked to the states, because if it's not or to this kind of phasic state, because if it's not, then you cannot really regulate it. Right? But if, in this case, you know, these studies show that you can regulate that and that the same signatures are also traits of psychiatric disorder. So probably psychiatric disorders are state based disorders in the sense of that you know you can modulate them and, and, and they have variants in, even within the disorder and there's recently a, a nature communications paper um, that looked at you know changes in um, in these uh, markers eg markers over time they track the person at home they're wearing some dbs electrodes and they looked at you know how do these uh, how do these um, signatures or biomarkers vary um, across time and there were some times when the person was feeling more depressed less depressed and actually, these signatures in the amygdala, for example, of gamma frequencies were changing uh, depending on, um, on how they were feeling. So you can track these kind of states or traits or symptoms of the patients uh, across time with even an um, hour or you know, minute, minute resolution. Right? So they're sensitive to those things. At least that's what the literature shows. So the question is now, can you track these microstates also? It might be interesting if somebody could wear you know, one of these raw electric caps you know, during the day, and then, you know, uh, on a scale of one to 10, say, okay, I feel this and these symptoms, and how then these, these, these states uh, track within subject. That would be a very interesting study to do, in fact, and, and see whether, you know, for sure, if you can separate within subject, then you have really um, some data that you can apply in that subject specifically, but also see whether the same kind of patterns occur between subjects, because at the moment, we're kind of comparing between subjects, but uh, in the sort of classic BCI uh, applications, you usually look at the subject specific signatures and how they're yeah, related to states. If you know, I, I haven't said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I may add to this question, I think the question is 
even more fundamental is what is the functional significance of these different microstates? Are they related to certain type of thoughts or certain type of of behavior? No? That's as far as I understood the question. And I think what we try to do or what we did also uh, in a collaboration with with, uh, with Rolf and, and Joao uh, is to instruct the people, healthy people in this case, instruct them to do a certain, to, 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 to go into a certain mental state by, for example, instructing them to think about past memories or instructing them to do mental arithmetics and see whether there are specific microstates that uh, react to this type of manipulation of of thoughts, so to give them more a more handle on the functional significance of the different states. So this, I think, should be done should be done more. But that that was quite successful of showing that one of the states is related to autobiographical episodic memory and another more to uh, mental arithmetics or attention functions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I haven't had time to cover all these domains, but there there are some studies that show that you know, depending on the task the person is in. For example, attention task or memory task, they will be different configurations yeah. of these states. So some will become more prevalent because obviously these generators will become more active depending on the task. Right? Mm -hmm. Just maybe Just... another question from uh, Mary. Yeah, you have your hand up. Yes, if there is time. Thank you. Uh, very nice uh, uh, presentation. You covered a lot of things. I was more curious uh, uh, to know your opinion or your expert advice on the methodology. For what I understood, you are mostly using uh, in uh, shallow architectures, you are still dealing with feature extraction. And I was wondering if there is any opportunity in any of the multiple steps to, to apply more deep architectures as to avoid, for instance, any, any feature structure if you need fast inference, for instance. Um, I don't know, you, yeah. you didn't mention it, and I was curious to know if there is yeah, a bottleneck that I'm not aware of. No, definitely a, a really um, relevant question, and actually something we, we crossed our minds whether you know you could use deep learning to classify this you know, more, more multidimensional, so you're not like classifying particular features, and that's exactly um, what we're also looking at. So it's a very interesting um, sort of point, and um, I think with deep learning, you know, it's always a question of how much data you have. So I think if you have deep data. And, and wide data, then you could deploy it. For example, if you had lots of subjects with eyes closed, eyes open, then maybe you could try to use deep learning. But in, uh, so far, in the cases that we try to use deep learning, we didn't really get enhanced classification accuracy because the samples are, I think, quite small. You know, some of the samples are 60 subjects, 100 subjects. So you know, for, for deep models, you, you need like thousands of samples uh, or, or examples. So, it remains to be seen whether that could probably enhance it, but definitely for neurofeedback, it's, it's an interesting uh, approach because basically it's parallel classification or parallel processing. So you can implement the classification very quickly, whereas a multi, a multi feature SVM will take time to calculate online, right? So definitely deep models are the future, I think, in this, in this case. Uh, but then, of course, with deep models, you get less explainability, right? So this gives you, like, okay, these maps really seem very. Uh, explain a lot of it with deep models then you have to find some ways of trying to you know unearth where what is the patterns that this the classifier is is, uh, is using essentially but it's it's not it's not it's not impossible that we know about it yeah, yeah. thank you in case of data as well, maybe one possibility, but maybe it's a crazy idea, it's to that you simulate data. Would that be feasible if you know a little bit well the type of artifacts that you may have in your signals, a type of noise or whatever, maybe you mm -hmm. could eventually as well simulate those data as, as a kind of data augmentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, to actually decrease noise and, and decrease the overfitting, you could yeah, simulate mm -hmm. some of the noisy data. Um, yeah, for sure, you could do that. Um, that wouldn't solve the, the, the signal in the data, you know, like the useful the stuff. But yeah, definitely um, there have been approaches now where People have used uh, deep learning in EG to to do in, even inverse models and then and, and also artifacting based on, on you know simulating forward models with artifacts. So um, yeah, there's definitely applications of of, of uh, deep learning uh, in EG. Yeah, there's a lot of papers coming out now. Thank you. Good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just on the previous topic, if you uh, were to 
uh, speculate by uh, this classification with the external stimuli? Do you think that would be more helpful for uh, diagnostics or therapeutic applications? You mean like uh, to have external kind of um, externally um, imposed states that are more specific, like instead of just resting state, you would yeah. do a task break? Yeah. Yeah, actually, so far there's been a few papers, not in DG directly, but in FMR, with fMRI signals, try to classify um, disorders and, and states uh, based on kind of tasks. And they, they find that it's actually more reliable because there's less degrees of freedom for the brain to kind of visit all its possibilities, right? So if, if you, for example, watch a video and the same people watch the same video, then you can see some differences between people more clearly than if it, they were just on the resting state. And the question is, you know, apart from videos, is there a specific task? Now, the other thing that I didn't talk about and I didn't have enough time is, as you said, you, you could maybe just take a, a very small window uh, during a task, like just before you have a trial uh, or a stimulus presented, okay, what's the brain state in that moment? And then, for example, in ADHD, with attention deficit disorder, you might try to classify, okay, what is the brain state that led to that error just before the error? And then take a small window and then just analyze web states in the smaller windows rather than over a sort of very large resting state. But that's something that we also want to do. Okay. There are no more questions. I think the questions make clear there is still a lot of work to do to answer <laughs> all the questions, but we are working on it. Or oh, Thomas is working on it. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Normally, yeah, we have more than an hour. I think we can stop here. And maybe you guys have more discussions after the talk there locally. I'm sorry I had good intentions to come, but the traffic didn't allow me. So thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, I give back thank to you.